Let's start. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Welcome to this debate. What economic governance for peace? Co-organized with the Cercle des Économistes, we want to thank them for their help in organizing the debate. According to some theorists, globalization was a way to create global collaboration links to stabilize peace. Cold War saw the creation of geo-economy with the perspective of military conflicts between the two blocs in the West with the US and in the East with USSR. But now this is the economic reality. Some mentioned a new world order, a new economy order, the economy being the strongest power tool. He used to write military threats and alliance lost their importance with the peace process of international exchanges. The economy is now in the first line and we see that in certain situations priority to certain economic actors and government to national interests create or increase tensions between stakeholders. Trade and economic flows increase the cooperation but also resentment between countries. So how to strengthen economic global governance to threaten peace? To answer those questions, Marie-Françoise Renard, professor at the Clermont Auvergne University, specialist in the Chinese economy and chair of the Université des Biens Communs organization in Clermont-Ferrand. You just published the book China in the Global Economy, published in Presse Universitaire Blaise Pascal Editions. Fernando Iglesias, Argentinian MP and member of the Mercosur Commission. You also take part in the Parliamentarians for Peace project. Denu Rodonnet, Chief Trade Enforcement Officer, Deputy Director General for Trade at the European Commission for the implementation of trade rules. Through video conference, and he should appear on our screen in a moment, Benjamin Corriat, Emeritus Professor of Economy in Paris Nord University, member of the Economist Atterré, author of The Well, The Common Good, Climate and Market, Les Liens qui Libèrent Editions. I believe Mr. Benjamin Corriat just answered the call. Let's go full screen so we can see him well. Thank you to the four of you for being with us for this debate. I'm going to start by asking you one question. How to think global economic governance to favor peace? Marie-Françoise, you can start. Hello, everyone. The question around peace is a political and geopolitical question first, which I'm not competent around economic governance, of course, and that's the topic of our conversation, will have a role to play in peace, but it's also a shared role with many other institutions and stakeholders. Current economic governance, as you know, is quite ancient. For most institutions, it came from the Bretton Woods agreements after World War II, and most of the UN institutions were created in the 60s. During a Cold War period, a clear hegemony of the US, and it's actually the US who defined the rules of global governance. This model worked quite well for a few years. It was seriously questioned in 71 by President Nixon with regards to the international monetary system, which has been amended, but not truly be rebuilt. And this model is now obsolete. The international economic institutions largely lost some of their legitimacy for several reasons. And we observe a risk of fragmentation of the world, which has become multipolar. And the definition of the US is no longer accept accepted. 
although the U.S. remain the dominating power. We'll probably get back to that. There are several possibilities for a legitimate global economic governance that's a condition for it to work for peace. We don't have much time, so I'm going to cover just two points. First, those international economic institutions must be rebuilt so that this north-south divide is not reproduced, the current north-south divide. We are in a hierarchy system. Development aid keeps on increasing, and it's based on rules defined by rich countries. Those rules are not even always respected by those countries. This situation is no longer acceptable representation of in development countries and in, in international institutions varies a lot. For UN institutions, it's one country, one voice, but for other institutions, it's proportional to quotas, therefore the wealth of the country. So this wealth hierarchy is reproduced. Inequalities have been reduced at global level. However, there is a polarization of wealth for the richer classes and significant poverty is maintained in many countries. As I just said, the risk is this fragmentation of the world. We see that new international institutions were created by China to, com to compete with the existing ones. And current institution of economic governance are based on this concept of hierarchy, leaving part of the countries away from the decision-making processes. Second point, a global economic governance needs legitimacy that is based on its perception and concern for the general interest and common interests. The emergency is not only the development of societies now, but their survival. The pandemic we're going through reminded us that the loss of biodiversity worked along the development of viruses. We know that the melting of the ice in the polar system will also lead to new viruses. Climate change will develop quickly and by 2050 more than 200 million people should have to leave their habitat due to climate reasons. In addition to the human drama, we can see the issues that this will raise. Let's not forget that the climate issue are or the people who suffer most from the climate impact are not those who trigger it. Certain goods are cross-national. They're a global wealth. There are other types of wealth, common wealth. The survival of humanity depends on the preservation and reproduction of common wealth. And in the future, international economic institutions must work to leave no one behind and exclude anyone from the use of those global wealths. Decisions are on different levels, of course, at local level, at national level, and states are very much attached to this concept of sovereignty, but also at international level. For instance, by helping countries rethink the, re the organization of the economy at global level, including CO2 emission, loss of natural resources, creating indicators based on a different rationale, which is also a political issue. But we cannot continue to support, those institutions cannot continue to support an economic framework that does not take into account the environmental and health issues. The many crit the Great criticism against my multilateralism are mainly addressed to the govern governance of multilateralism. And for economic govern governance to be helpful for peace, 
must take into account rules that include the interests of the population so that part of the planet is not submitted to the other part. And on the other hand, it must take into account the concerns of the common wealth of the world. For instance, by giving up on economic targets that do not include the environmental impact, including the non-exclusion to education or health services and also the use of data. This might sound like a utopia, but I believe the emergency of today means that tomorrow governments might face more and more violent pressure from the population who are worried about the situation. And in that case, decisions would have to be made urgently. So we need to start thinking about those necessary changes today. Thank you very much, Mrs. Renard. Denis Rodonnet, I'm going to give you the floor for the same question. I see that we have uh, new viewers coming. Have a seat, get comfortable. Denis Rodonnet. What global economic governance for peace? Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm going to try and continue with what Mrs. Renard just said. Global economic governance is large. I will be talking about one aspect of global economic governance, the one I practice, that is trade and investment governance. And to me, Global economic governance is three pillars, investment, monetary and financial governance, and another even more complex one that is regulatory and standard governance, which is designed by multiple regulation organizations to streamline those regulations through regulations cooperation. I know the first pillar more than the others, and there's a lot to say about financial and investment governance. This is quite a structured branch. Since World War II, it created an order, a legal economic order, which was stable for quite a while, but that is now fragilized seriously weakened the degradation of economic governance around trade and investments. What does that mean? Many things. It's a multilateral foundation of rules which come from the World Trade Organization. In addition, there's an addition layer that is f bilateral free trade treaties, which are added to that multilateral foundation, and also a whole forest of international treaties around investments. We are seeing more and more development activities at bilateral regional level around trade and investment, and much less progress at multilateral level. And I don't think that the bilateral layer is weakening the multilateral foundation. Many people have this thesis. I don't. I think there's a base erosion that is related to two things, internal issues at WTO, WTO has, due to a lack of progress, suffered from this erosion. And WTO is not progressing for several reasons. They relate to the institution and the political will of its members. WTO is the sum of the political will of its members. There is a deficit of political will within WTO to produce new trade rules, multilateral rules, to ensure that this multilateral foundation, the inst institution, remains relevant to uh, 
the current world. That is, for instance, uh, electronic trade. There is a lack of discipline around economic distortion, as we can see in China, through massive incentives in certain industries. This is not properly covered by current rules, and WTO members have not come to an agreement to design new rules in order to remain aligned with the current economic reality that WTO is supposed to regulate. Due to a lack of common definition of objectives and probably a lack of convergence around an agenda to negotiate new trade rules which could articulate around this commonwealth and the sustainable development goals. And also a lack of flexibility in the way the international governance system works. It's heavy, it questions the economic sovereignty of the states who have to mutualize them, and therefore this technology is experiencing difficulties in producing results fast. And WTO probably didn't make use of the flexibility available to the states to design those international economic rules. But it wouldn't be too bad if there was just this. The issue is that it's an actual setback, not a lack of progress. There is a, an erosion of this international system's coverage and power simply because there are gaps in the system. The aspect of litigation resolution of WTO is failing. And one of the core aspects of the system that is following a litigation resolution system does not work anymore. One can easily imagine that when this international legal system's relevancy is weakened, then some might be tempted to get away from those rules and not following them. That's an increasing phenomenon. Beyond the difficulties of the institution itself, I believe this also reflects a phenomenon outside of WTO. For instance, the increasing impact of geopolitical tensions on the economic relationships. For instance, the US confrontation, which has an impact on the weakening of the international trade system. Today, the US and China manage their bilateral relationships outside of WTO, although they're members. The US no longer respect their basic commitments, meaning that they impose illegal tariffs to China, and they're not part of this lit litigation system. So that's some of the gaps. This is very concerning probably even more than what we th sometimes think, because trade goes on. But there is a slow erosion of the regulatory system, and for us, as Europeans, is a concern. That's why we should react to it. I'm sure we'll have, um, well, we'll talk about this during the debate. I'll, I'll just um, finish the um, um, finish the, the going around the table and giving the floor to Benjamin Coriat. Benjamin, if you can just wait for a second, we'll try to connect the sound. So, what world economic government governance for, for peace? I want to thank you for this um, for inviting me for this round t to this round table and and and, and with a round table with crucial themes and in a brief time that we have i just want to send three telegrams that could be useful to the discussion first telegram is to say as 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 uh, ms renard 
uh, has said, and uh, we ha I think we have a lot in common, I want to say that we are faced with an extreme fragility of institutions that take part in um, world economic governance. And more than a fragility, it's the, it's the fact that they're outdated and, 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 uh, and they've lost all efficiency. I'll just give two examples. In 47, the, um, um, the FAO was, um, was created and, the, and the, the World Food Program, and today we have a billion people who are undernourished, so it doesn't work. The, there is the, the COVID crisis, and I'll, I'll go back to that, to the crisis, and WHO is totally marginalized and plays no part, and it is, and, and it is a public-private um, foundation, organization, COVAX, um, which is in charge of, of, um, of uh, giving out vaccines, which is an absolute scandal. So outdated and inappropriate and fr fragile sta status and, and condition of institutions. The second telegram is that the only f solid foundation so far in world economic governance is WTO. And WTO, is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, has had a positive um, role by enabling exchanges to thaw between various countries at a, during the during a period of growth, um, and and we can see the, the the negative consequences of growth then. But today, WTO has a role that is totally counterproductive. Why? Because WTO has been. Uh, has been a, 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 has basically been a bonus given to um, whoever uh, was doing less in terms of environment, in terms of um, um, society. So basically, the condition of the planet today is is, um, is 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 very bad, and it's not only linked to WTO. It's also because, um, but it's also because countries are unable to agree. Um, Within WTO, that um, so countries are unable to agree that um, we should move away from that model where we should just do things in a cheap way and not um, take care of the environment or of social conditions of workers. And so we know that there's a lot of, a lot of poverty, a lot of inequality, a lot of, um, and, and added to that is issues with the climate and with the pandemics. And I agree with, Madame, with Mrs. Renard on that point. All this is uh, linked together. The pandemics is linked to deforestation, is linked to the destruction of biodiversity, and is linked to the ecological crisis. And so these crises are, are certainly twin crises. So to face this crisis, to tackle this crisis, we need other institutions. So I'll, I'll try and, and, and remain very brief, but I want to send a very strong worded telegram and, and hoping that maybe we can use that telegram in the discussion. So there's a time when there was a time of the declaration of the human rights. Or then there was a time of the universal declaration of um, human rights in 1948. And on that were built a number of international institutions with an equal results. But these institutions have played a part. But I think we are in the time of the declaration of the declaration of the access to common goods or to global common goods. So we need to protect and have access to these common goods, these um, global common goods. We won't be able to um, move out of this crisis, which is just a, a, an exacerbation of the, the period that we were in. And a number of um, organizations, are international, a number of international organizations have said that we are going to enter a period where pandemics will be repeated. Um, and these new institutions need to focus on these crucial questions. And I want to go even further. Um, 
and say that once the objectives have been um, expressed, have been uh, set, and once there are new rights that would be recognized, access to common goods that are protected and that are in a, in a, in a, in a good condition, uh, because my feeling is that the new governments can only be multi-centric. We live in a world where there are several centers, if you like, and we need to use that multi-centric dimension while trying to obtain commitments towards common objectives. So in, in the short time that I had, uh, this is what I wanted to, to say, and I'm sure we can say a lot more in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin Corriat, for also for keeping time. Uh, Fernando, I'll give you the floor. Okay. Okay. Je m'excuse, mais je vais parler en anglais parce que mon mon français est disparu. I'm sorry, I will speak <laughs> English. My French is totally uh, disappeared. Basically, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, my colleagues, for such uh, uh, interesting explanations. Uh, we are crossing a bifurcation point. This is the basic thing. I wish to say, we're changing from a culture, an economy, a politics which were basically national into an economy and uh, a culture and uh, uh, politics which are basically global. This is a dramatic change in the history of humanity. And we are changing from industrialism, meaning we produce goods and value through uh, the muscle through the repetitive uh, human labor with, with the hands, towards the creation of value through our brains, through the creation of communication, information, knowledge, div cultural diversity, subjectivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are two dramatic change in the history of humanity we are crossing. And we are crossing in a very, very fast way. We are living in a time of change and in a time of accelerated ch change, faster, faster than ever. And the consequence is that global processes are overtaking and are predominating over national and regional ones. So if we are, we are speaking about peace, we have to speak about global peace. If we are speaking about economy, we need to speak about a global economy. And the different pace of the change is a Big problem, it's the big problem. I mean, if you examine our economy, our technology, they are basically global, but our institutions are still fixed at the national scale. Even in, after the Second World War, we created the European Union, and this was a, a big achievement, and we created the United Nations, and this was another big achievement. Basically, everything is still based 80%, 70%, you tell me, uh, on the national level of decision in which every state has to think first in its interest and every politician has to think first in the interest of his nationalists. And this is a big, big problem, this imbalance. You have a global economy, but you have national politics. And then you can read all the spectrum, political spectrum of the world according to what is the best way to rebalance the system? You have those who think that we, na we need to nationalize the economy, get out the European Union, out of the euro, uh, uh, protective uh, mm, protectionism and mercantilism, Latin America, uh, Trump in the States, etc. Let's go back to the past, let's go back to the national economy in order to unbalance the global uh, economy, we need to, to, to go, to move uh, to the past. But there is another option, which is we should, we have already, we continue to globalize the technology and the economy, then we need to globalize politics. Basically, the, we need to globalize the human rights, we need to globalize the institutions, we need to globalize uh, a conception uh, of the culture, a conception of the society, which is becoming global without, of course, ignoring national diversities, local diversities, etc. These have to be part of the thing. 
And now we are facing new global tensions between China and the, US, the USA. Uh, I mean, many think that we are going, moving for, to, towards uh, a new uh, big war, another cold war like the previous one. So, if we observe the general landscape, we are crossing through five big global crises. The economic crisis, financial instability, unbalance between politics and economy, impotence of national states to fix uh, the rules, etc. Ecological one, so you know, climate change basically, but also you now pandemics. Uh, demographic and the social and political tension associated with the migrations and uh, a crisis of security connected with global terrorism but also international conflict and uh, also a crisis on technology, meaning the, um, the emergence of new technologies, the emergence of disruptive technologies like uh, uh, artificial intelligence which could be disruptive of our way. So what can we do? Basically, well, the basic thing, in my opinion, is we need to reform the institutional system. We need a real uh, global governance which has to be based on the same principles we defend at the national level. If we speak at the national level, we are in favor of democracy and we are in favor of federalism. If we speak at the regional level, we are in favor of a more democratic and federal Europe at least me, I am, a, I am a guy from Spinelli, so. But we need to apply federalism and, and democracy to the global level, to the global governance. And if we start to think this way, this is very difficult, I know everybody knows the, the difficulties, but it's time we, we move in this, uh, in this direction. Think about, we, we think about the possibility of having uh, carbon tax, Tobin tax, a military tax, at the global level, because Europe is very brave on putting on the table the question of the carbon tax and the towing tax. But you can't apply for a long time this at the regional or the national level. You need to get global for this in order to compensate the differences. If we are able to do so, we have first a dissuasive effect on the pollution through carbon tax. We have a dissuasive effects on international speculation about uh, through towing tax. We have an effect, a dissuasive effect on a spend on military through a military tax, etc. And then we have resources, resources for two basic things. We need to create a global welfare system uh, about education first and also health. Think, think about the pandemic and the disorganization. We we, we use it to face such a big global problem. And in, second, in a second uh, instance, we, we could use, use these resources in order to make some, something which is directly connected with the survival of humanity, which is the green reconversion of the productive system. We need resources for that, and this is a, pro, a, a possible way to do. I know this is very difficult, we need to to think in, on different levels. We need, of course, to reinforce the regional level and to democratize and to federalize the regional level, not only European Union, also the Mercosur, but we need also to reform the United Nations system and we need to create new institutions like uh, United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, some kind of embryo of a world parliament in order to have global tax because we don't, we shouldn't have uh, taxes without representation. Finally, this is uh, the battle, the political battle of the future. I see many young people here, maybe it's too late uh, to me, but for you, this is the, the um, crucial political battle of the future, the crucial political battle of this century, and this is not about the right, the left, the conservatives, this is about all the democratic people all over the world which needs to be in a more democratic and uh, peaceful and humane world. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Merci, Fernando Iglesias. Alors, on vient de le voir à travers uh, vos premières réponses. Le Thank you, Fernando. And we saw through the, the various replies that that question can ask in, 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 in many ways. Do you feel that organ that um, do you feel that do you feel that today there's um, there's the the um, institutional organizations are outdated? Benjamin, I'll let you answer first. There's a crisis of multilateralism, but the main concern, and we'll get back to the health crisis as well, let's be more specific, but health is one of the rare areas where there is a true multilateral organization. It has some cons, but also some pros. Uh, information uh, diffusion, creating standards, protocols, support. And in the past, mostly for countries of the South, WHO had a great role in this regard. However, what have we observed? Many private organizations, for instance, the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, which marginalized WHO and created what's called COVAX, which was supposed to be a guarantee for an equitable distribution of vaccines throughout the world. But you know the result. The result is that us in the countries of the North are at our booster when Africa has only vaccinated 5% of its population. So beyond the intergovernmental crisis and beyond the international institution crisis, we see that when there are large private companies, their power is such that they can marginalize international institutions, which creates an institution that is a disgrace in terms of international equity. Not only it's absolutely not efficient, against the pandemic, but it also shows a very high degree of inequality and cynicism, which is very shocking, especially around vaccine distribution. So to conclude, shall we use existing international organizations and strengthen them or create new ones that are more relevant? That is a question. But What's certain is that the power taken by private initiatives at multinational level is far greater than what the earth can take. Mrs. Renard, I think you wanted to react to Benjamin Coriat's comment. First, I fully agree with what he just said. Let's go back to what you said around the criticism around my multilateralism. I think there is great confusion around free trade and international trade. For decades, I studied and gave classes around international trade. And the standards of world trade don't say that world trade benefits all. What it says is that there is an overall gain in uh, global trade instead of protectionism. And when international institutions were created, created, there was a lot of anxiety around what happened in the 1930s or 40s, where protectionism was one of the causes of the crisis. And it was associated to wars. However, international trade and everybody should know and say this, creates winners and losers. And the role of government is to offset loss, but n with while trading internationally. I don't know any country except some Eastern Bloc countries who did not work, want to trade at international level. The condition of the survival of international trade is to compensate the losers, which was not done. And 
very often protectionist policies mainly relied on lobbies, therefore on negotiation powers, not on compensation for losers. So that is the image of multilateralism. I'm not saying that there is no result. We got here because of a lack of policies to compensate the negative impacts of world trade. But I think there's a substantial mistake when presenting world trade. And I think there were disastrous failures of the governments around trade policies. Thank you. Denis Rodonnet, maybe we can talk more specifically about the European Union. What, what can you say about this? Yes. Following what was said, two comments. Of course, we have great interest in creating new forms of governance, including of international economic governance. For instance, basically anything that goes beyond the foundations of the system that is intergovernmental institutions, which includes a lot of problems. In the end, it's very difficult for sovereign states to pull together different aspects of their regulatory and economic sovereignty. We can and we must look into the involvement of stakeholders that are not state stakeholders in certain areas for climate, for instance, where there's not only a lack of rules but also of fundings, where we must try and go beyond this current system. But however, we cannot accept that existing institutions become obsolete. So what can Europe do? As member of WTO, Europe must get involved in reforming WTO and the European Union must make proposals. The main issue at WTO to me is not only an, an not mainly an issue of legitimacy. Well, we saw it with the election of the general director of WTO. There was a block before Dr. Ngonzi took over WTO. There was a blocking for several months, I believe, by Trump. There are uh, lacks of flexibility in the system. The absolute rule of consensus as a taboo is a mistake. Saying that everybody must progress at the same pace in producing rules and therefore making pure multilateralism and not allowing different progress, as long as they're not detrimental to the most advanced ones, is a mistake. Proposals must be made so how can the European Union work in that regard? First of all, make proposals to reform WTO and help WTO work around those three pillars. What is it? Creating rules. For this, you need an agenda. The EU wants to propose an agenda of negotiation of new rules, both when there is a problem around competition rules for them to be more fair and efficient, but also for WTO to enter positive areas around a commonwealth, for instance, trade and environment, trade and climate, trade and health. EU is making proposals within WTO, but what's needed here is political will from the states. If there's no such thing, then it's not possible to progress and modernize the system. But I don't think that the issue is an issue of institutional deficit, but of political def deficit. Because WTO as an international institution is not the worst institution. It works on one voice, one country basis, not like IMF. I'd like to comment something quite different from what was said so far as the EU, and that's a proposal from me for the debate, we must be able to navigate, to defend our European interests through 
a situation where there is a blocking around international governance. So we must be able, when necessary, to have self-sufficient European tools to reach our ambitions. That's what we do around regulating competition. We're able to use self-sufficient instruments in compliance with our international commitments or so within those commitments to defend ourselves. For instance, against forced technology transfers by filtering direct investments abroad. The EU has created a mechanism in this area and also getting self-sufficient instruments to uh, propose a sustainable development agenda around trade. And I don't think WTO is an obstacle to this. I'll just give an example to conclude. The European Commission has proposed to the Parliament, so the European legislator, a series of proposals in that regard at the border to fight carbon leakage. It's very likely going to be an instrument to avoid importing products that come from forced labor, a self-sufficient European instrument to prevent importations and to block at the borders products that lead to deforestation. We believe that if this is done in order to truly support the global commonwealth, and if it's not protectionism in disguise, then this is allowed by WTO rules and our participation of the global trade system. That's where we want to get. Thank you. Fernando Iglesias, I just want to make sure translation is working. Do you share this opinion? Meaning that international organizations have become obsolete and this comment around potential rejection of multilateralism. Could you answer more specifically about your region in Latin America? What are the current stakes at the moment? Well, thank you. I don't think we Latin Americans have too much to teach to the rest of the world, to be frank, uh, because we, uh, we have spoke, spoken for decades about unity and et cetera, et cetera, where we are still divided and the progress in the regional um, is institution is very, very slow. Um, I was part of the Mercosur Parliament. I was part of the Latin American Parliament. I am part of the Argentine Parliament and I have to say we are not a model at all right now. Anyway, I wish to make uh, some comment about the European role, which is, in my opinion, crucial and being in France, uh, it's uh, relevant. Uh, at the end, the First World War, if we are thinking about the relation between economy and peace, think about experience. The First World War um, was the end of the golden age of the first globalization. And the global scenario was very similar to now. So the previous big power, uh, the England, England was decaying, and the new ones were Nobody knew if uh, the United States or maybe Germany, etc. So, and the new ones were less democratic than the previous one because you can make a lot of criticism about uh, British imperialism, but you know, uh, the Germany and the Italians and the Japanese were at those times very, very uh, worse than the others. So, the first war was about uh, in the conflict. Uh, between national powers in order to uh, conquer uh, markets and uh, raw materials, etc. At the end of the First World War, the idea was we need to recreate the, 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 um, the system, the national system, and we need to have one people in one nation, st national state. So, Let's stop the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Let's stop the empires. Put the Czechs with the Czechs. Put the Germans with the German and the Spanish with the Spanish. This was a very good idea, but at some time, some some people in in Germany say, "Oh, what are the Jewish doing here?" No? So this is a really bad idea. The idea of 
uh, unifying uh, a culture, uh, uh, an ethnic origin with a political power. The democratic political power has to be plural, has to be multicultural, has to be, uh, has to include people from different, different parts. And this was the result at the end of the Second World War. The new idea was to recreate Europe under this principle. People from different origins, people from dif different cultures, religions, et races, et cetera, et cetera, could live together under the same political unity as well as we respect uh, plurality in terms of ideology and uh, religion and uh, ethnic origin, etc., etc. This is the basic idea for thinking the future of the world. We need to live under the same political umbrella because we need political decision making in order to uh, face, to cope, to solve global crisis. It's very well known. Global crisis requires global solutions. Global solution has to be democratic. If we need global uh, democratic solutions, we need some kind of reform of the institution, reform of the United Nations, reform of the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, uh, WTO, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think in this term, I finish with this, the basic idea is democracy resides in representation. Representation means parliaments. And this is, uh, even if we are going to reform the United Nations, we need political legitimacy in order to do so. And the basic idea is to have some kind of as parliamentary assembly inside the United Nations in order to discuss the future reform. I think this is the way, this is not for tomorrow. There are many campaigns, you, you can check the UNPA campaign and the different experience about this, the World Face Movement, I am, I, I am part. Uh, but these are the ideas. Ideas are powerful. The difference between the end of the First World War and going to Nazism and Fascism and war and the, the end of the Second World War, which was going to the European Union, was about ideas, how we human beings organize our societies. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando Iglesias, for your honesty. In order to have some time to give the floor to the audience, I'd like to ask you a last brief question. I'll ask you to answer quickly. To sum up, what should change? What measures could be adopted to favor global peace? I'll give you the floor, Denis Rodonnet. I think we need to stabilize the system that exists where it has proved that it, it worked. We need to reform it in terms of content of agendas, in terms of, but we need to be able, we also need to reestablish um, what has been um, fragilized and the risk of going back to international economic relations on f going from, from a system based on the rule of law to a system based basically on strength or a power of balance is very dangerous. There is no doubt that we will move to a phase where there will be tendencies in various directions on, on some levels of, of um, international economic relations. There's more and more integration. There's a, a, a regulatory cooperation that's more and more advanced. But there's also fragmentation because there is an interface between trade, commerce, investment, emerging technologies that you've mentioned, and issues of security, international security. And that zone, if you like, that area is very hard to, to, to regulate within existing international organizations so that's where we need to f that's what we need to focus on that we to, to make sure that geopolitical tensions that exist that are real do not um, weaken too much um, a construction of governments that is naturally fragile because it is and I fear that it will remain so intergovernmental even though there are advances beyond pure 
um, intergovernmentability, if you like. So, and, and so I guess the European Union is a form of laboratory. It's gone further, um, and the, 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 the level of political will of integration beyond intergovernmentalism that we are experiencing here as Europeans is not an objective that is shared on a global level. I don't think that it exists on a global level, even though we are extremely favorable to the parliamentary dimensions, including in an economic um, uh, um, governance, and, 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 and the EU supports the, 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 the parliamentary um, um, levels or dimensions at WTO. So it can be another way to do that. So, if on the other hand, can one rethink that the, that will that global? Let me say this: uh, at the end of the first and the second world, there was a big polemic about what to do. Democratic people was discussing uh, the question of what what is first: do we need first an Italian democracy and then a, Fre and a French democracy, a British democracy, and then we think about uh, regional integration. This was, uh, at the beginning of the century, the basic idea. Let's be democratic and then we think about uh, integration. This was a complete failure because if you have just a single state who empowers nationalism and authoritarianism and blitzkrieg, etc., you have to take your army, you have to resist, you have this carried directly, this idea carried directly to, to, the, to the war. The, 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 the enlightened um, vision of many uh, intellectuals or politicians like Altiero Spinelli, Jean Monnet, Schumann, changed the things at the end of the Second World War. They realized it, that it was impossible to have an Italian democracy, a French democracy, without regional integration. And this was about one century ago. I afraid we are facing the same question at the global level now. Can we have a democratic Europe when the, if the rest of the world is not democratic, if we are facing a possible conflict between the Chinese and the United States? Because China and the United States are very strong in economy and in technology, et cetera, et cetera, but Europe has the basic knowledge about something which is even more important, which is politics. The experience of a continent in which wars were the basic way of living for centuries. A continent that was the worst place in the world to live in during the first half of the past century. And it became the best place of the world where to live during the rest of the century under regional integration. So this is a claim I have to, this I have sp spoken with many European leaders, including Joseph Borrell, my friend, and every, so I think Europe is uh, undertaking, is underestimating the power of the European Union and the uh, extraordinary model is the European Union for the war. I don't speak about exporting democracy like Bush. <laughs> no, I, th I, I say, when I think of the future, we, we need to base on present experience and past experience. And the best experience in the history of humanity is the European Union. It's the, the change from a continent, which was some years before, in genocide, war, and the worst authoritarian regimes into a democratic system, a federal system. So I think if you don't want to save democracy in Europe, if the European Union want to save uh, regional integration inside the European Union, they have to push the model towards the world. Because let me be uh, a little provocative. Europe has no a, a single problem. Europe has not a single problem. All the problems Europe, Europe have are global problems. So there is a problem of immigration, of course, but the problem is not European, it's the African and Latin America. 
there is a problem of financial instability, you know, 2008, etc., etc. But it was an American problem. Now we have the COVID, the COVID crisis and the pandemic. It's a Chinese problem. So Europe, as le, a border, has no. Okay. So think about you. If Europe wants to say it's a model, we need this has to be the model in the future of the war, as soon as when, as soon as possible. Benjamin Coriat, I'll ask you to be brief so we can have questions from the audience. What are the reforms that need to be led in priority? What solutions? Yes, there are institutional reforms that need to be envisaged. So should we start from existing institutions? Should we create new institutions? I think it'll be a bit of both. You can't, of course, erase the the, um, the existing institutions, whatever their defect, the flaws. There's one thing I'd like to insist on. Whether we go towards the transformation of existing institutions or whether we create new institutions, what is crucial for the future of peace and of a stable economic system is the credibility of commitments. And we need to be able to hold, our pro to, to hold our promises and commitments. I'm not saying that um, because if we look at COP21, COP21 was only possible because we promised a, a green fund of 100 billion euros. That green fund ha is not being, um, um, there's no money being put into it. And, and there's been, there's been um, failures on, on all levels at that, on that same if we go, just going back on that, we talk of a carbon tax at the borders of Europe, but then we need to stop giving the right to pollute freely, for free, to, to European um, companies, because otherwise this carbon tax has no uh, credibility. So we cannot build a world if there's no truth, if you like, no credibility. Um, of commitments, we we same for Covax, we we, we and and behind Covax there is this this um, nationalism in terms of vaccine from the European Union, where where countries would store and hoard um, vaccines while the rest of the world was was um, undergoing a, a huge crisis in terms of the pandemic. So yes, we need to start from existing institutions. Yes, create new institutions maybe. But what needs to change is that commitments must be sincere, must be credible, and must um, generate effects. Marie-Françoise Renard, you were agreeing to what uh, uh, Benjamin was saying. I'll give you the last word. What are the solutions, uh, or the, 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 the more urgent solutions? Yes, I agree with what my three colleagues have said. We cannot export democracy or political levels, or political models. But very often one has the feeling that Europe is not convinced that it can play a political role in, face of, in the face of giants. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a shame. And, 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 and Europe won't meet that leader or that leader. And if we want to save things, to improve things, as uh, Benjamin said, we need credibility. We need political will at the start. Uh, well, in international organizations can only um, work, function if countries within them accept to, f to fund them, to, to finance them, to, 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 to play the game. The, the, the China and the United States play outside of the, um, of the WTO. So there needs to be that political will, and that political will needs to be respected, which means that in the economic objectives that are defined by these inter international institutions, we need to modify our vision of economic systems to integrate the, the topics that we've mentioned on health, on education, on, um, the, on the environment, and so forth. If there's no political will to, to, for things to change, things won't change. It's very difficult to talk about it in such a brief, condensed way, but that's really at the heart of the problem. Thank you. Thank you for your very frank 
um, responses and, and for your thank you for your expertise on a topic that's very complex. But we'll take now questions from the audience. We have a question at the f two questions at the front. Thank you. It's a very interesting discussion. I'd like to give a very short contribution and, and ask a question. We talked a lot about international trade and rules on a global level. We also mentioned AIDS. But if we analyze what's been in terms of AIDS, we've reached the same conclusion. An international cooperation that has not upheld their commitments and international cooperation that is not legitimate because as um, Madame Renard said, countries who talk of cooperation and AIDS are only the, f the funders, the donors. And, and when they want, and, and when they, they, they add countries from the south, they, they add Saudi Arabia or Qatar. So we have a structure, structure that is inappropriate, especially regarding COVID, the, the there was a three person rise uh, of the of the AIDS um, in t of the the, the, the the demand of AIDS in terms of, of, of um, in, f in the face of that pandemics, which was obviously not enough. And everyone is saying that the, the situation is very shaky. We have new actors, um, India, emerging countries, Argentina, there are new objectives in terms of um, sustainable development and there are new modernities and south-south cooperation is not exactly the same as north-south um, cooperation one belt is different to 3bw and so forth but in a turbulent situation in situation of um, troubles like this can we make are we sure that cooperation is only the definition of rules and and aids if I go back in time, I need to, and I, 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 will, I will see that the OECD that was supposed to to manage the uh, the, the Marshall money and the Marshall funds s didn't know what to do, and basically what was created was very was uh, tables where very or round tables where various ministers would send or various countries would send ministers to discuss what would do so that we, that there would be a common narrative that would be um, expressed between peers. But today we don't have these tables where these discussions can take place because it's not WTO, it's not. Um, so where, where, where do you have a table? Where can you find a table where China, United States, the European Union would sit down and talk and agree on a common narrative? It's not only rules, it's something else political will cannot exist beforehand because that's what you're looking for. But where do you get it? You will find it around tables where people can talk. And unfortunately, OECD is, is, uh, it, it has, it has a, a general strategy that is from Australia that was selected, uh, that was, that was uh, nominated with the support of English speaking countries. So. Europe is um, a good example because there's a permanent dialogue between the countries of European, between the various countries before the institutions were built. What do you think of all that? It's a very briefly, the idea that we often have is, as, we, as you said, in a multilateral body, everyone talks. You say, yes, we sit around the table, people talk. Today it's not possible because there are too much, the much of, too much of a, a balance of power and there's no, and, and beforehand there used to be a consensus that the United States were dominant, but then you could still talk. But today it's not the same. And I agree with the fa I agree with what Benjamin Coelho said, that we can have multi-centrism, if you like, and there would be several tables of, of reflection uh, between countries that have things in common or so maybe it would be better that everyone can talk together but today we can see that it's not possible or it seems to be very uh, 
hard to implement. And so there will be several levels of discussion depending on the country. For Europe, yes, it's obvious. The, 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 the solution we can have, then one can talk about the content of treaties and modalities and so forth, but we have a regional position that comes from common interest, from common history. One can see that Europe, that started from nothing, if you like, is something today, does exist today. So for us, yes, it is a solution. But in the geographical area, the situation is different. Just to, I like that, 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 I think it's a very interesting question, and I share your, your wish to say that, yes, we need places within institutions, um, including hard law institutions, where one can deliberate, one can, can discuss, one can deliberate, where one can sit together and talk, not only on, on how the, the rule of law is, is to be implemented, which is important, and I, I'm, I'm in favor of hard law uh, in terms of international um, trade law, but WTO should also be a place of political deliberation between members. And why is it important? For instance, in the in in the in the international body of uh, governance for commerce, everyone is part of it. China and and America are still there, and there won't be that many institutions where they sit at the same table and where they are at the same table we need to we need to be able to we need to try to protect that and preserve that can you see a change with the arrival of joe biden at the white house there's a an obvious change which is just that the um, that administration has understood that it needs to work with others and is not against multilateral um Institutions, which is a huge change. However, the 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 tensions um, regarding America are there, and and will are, are there to last. So I have to to. Uh, I'll just give you the floor, and I'm, 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 I hear that Marie-France is very good at admirating, sir. So yes, my, uh, Marie-France, you can replace me because I have to do some interviews for my TV channel. But I want to thank all of you, and I'll leave you, um, I'll leave Marie-Francoise uh, continue and, and, and take that questions. I need to I need to remember my question because there has been a lot of things that have been said since I thought about my question. But one tool we're talking about reforming institutions, but how can we raise awareness among nations of their responsibilities, and how can we generate that transition? Can we reform? Can we can we start that that reforming process? And how can we can we? F make nations realize how urgent it is to 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 reform them since i've become a moderator i don't need to answer so i'll give the floor maybe denis or maybe fernando who wants to yes i can say one thing with an example i'll, I'll take an example in, in in the area that i know but it's the same issues in climate in uh, in many other um, fields, but first, we need, through political work, make all actors understand, including very important actors and stakeholders who, who feel they can they can do away with um, multilateralism. We need to to make them realize that if they if they do away, if they don't respect multilateralism, it has a cost. And it means that you cannot produce systemic, sustainable, durable um, solutions. Take the South American situation. Take the, the American administration. The previous American administration had decided to move away from that framework to go into um, a trade war with China to get a bilateral agreement with um, 
with China, the phase one agreement. That bilateral agreement of the Trump administration with China means that tariffs um, have been reduced slightly, and tariffs imposed by um, uh, and and what did Americans get after imposing those um, tariffs? They obtained to sell a little more soy and not much else. And they didn't get much else to to try to solve um, the, the problems on China that have spillover effects upon international economic relations. The fact that there are state companies, that the subsidies within the economy and so forth, or, or the forced transfers of technology. So a bilateral solution won't produce much because in reality, these are systemic changes, but a, a country like China will only, will only start those changes if it can monetize on the international level the implementation of these, um, of these uh, methods with the whole world, not with just one, not with just one actor. So there is a superiority of the, of the multilateral solution based on rules uh, compared to that bilateral uh, uh, mercantile solution. The problem is efficiency. It's harder to produce because there are more actors involved and some more different interests that need to be reconciled as, as with, a face, with, a, um, with, a, with a bilateral duel, if you like. So there's a, there's a trade, that's a trade-off. Benjamin, did you want to respond to that? It's a very difficult question, but there's just one thing I'd like to say, which is the notion of um, um, deliberation and democracy. Or del del but I ha my definition is a bit different to, to one the one that's been used so far. It's very good to deliberate in representative um, um, organs. Of course, one needs to do that. It's, it's very important in the French Parliament, for instance. Is there true deliberation? Because we have political sides, and and as soon as a law is proposed, one knows what the vote will be. Because so there's no real deliberation. But one thing I'd like to say, and because I think it is important, is that the invention of citizen, what is called citizens' conventions. There was a citizens' convention on climate. And in other countries, there are citizens' conventions where it's pure, true deliberations because people are away from lobbies, away from political parties, and, sh and, and deliberate truly. And, that de and these deliberations reach solutions in the French um, case. There were 149 propositions, but that weren't respected by, by politicians. So yes, we need to renovate the, 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 the processes, process of decisions. We need to introduce deliberative democracy on the national level, but why not? Also at levels that are above the, the nation. I'm not saying that we need to move away or do away with um, elective democracy, but we need to renovate that, that decision process. And so deliberative um, democracy through citizens' conventions, for instance, is one of the possible ways. And its implementation can be in many, many domains, first on the national level, but if national states um, um, uh, get a mandate from, from a citizens' convention, then we could move with these ways of transformation and go, go to changes that would go beyond national interests or the national interests as they are seen by national leaders. Well, if you look at the situation of the, uh, of the, la the last 10 or 20 years, the basic conclusion is that global phenomena predominate over national ones. So pandemic was very clear about that. This was an amazing, an amazing experience. The first time 
I think, in the history of humanity in which most of half of the humanity was sharing uh, such a strong situation about, you know, lockouts and the mascara and everything, you know. And this has something to say to us. Uh, if we continue to have an international landscape, an international scenario in which competition predominates over solidarity and cooperation, where uh, tensions are growing up, uh, where um, so there is where democracy and federalism is just uh, empty words. They are just empty words. So we are going to lose national democracies and regional integration and so on. So that's why. So I'm thinking about the problem of uh, AIDS. Um, you know, I, I don't think this is the. There are many critic, critics about the um, the real effects of of. of the, the monetary help to the third world. And let me be very uh, synthetic. Uh, for years and years, I'm from Argentina, for years and years we hear the real problem of the third world and the undevelopment is because the first world takes the resources and the money and so on, so we can develop. After that, we had the oil uh, war of prices and the oil was raising and raising the price, and an enormous amount of money went to the Arabian countries. Look at the Arabian countries. There is uh, uh, something similar at, at, the, at the European level of democracy, human rights. There is not. So it's not only about the money. Money is important, you have to follow, but it's not about the money. When I see, I, I told you that the... Um, current situation was very similar to the First World War and the reasons for which uh, the First World War started, which was a suicide of Europe, that, 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 that war. But it's, uh, it's also similar to the Second World War. The Second World War was about the unification of Europe. The Hitler attempt was the attempt of unificating Europe in a military way, genocidal, criminal, etc. But he wanted to unify Europe under the German hegemony. And that was very rational. This was not just crazy, because national states were created at the moment of the first industrialism, you know? Small fabrics, manufacture, um, steam, trains, etc. And the level, the, the dimension of national states, of the European national state, was adapted to this technology. But then, the second revol industrial revolution happened, and then we have faster trains and more production, and we need, we need more markets, and we need more raw materials, and so on. So everybody went to have more uh, territorial space. You know, the what's the the, the, germ, the Nazi expression for that? Uh, Lavensrat, or well, my, my German is even worse than my French. <laughs> uh, so I mean, the problem is we are. So why the two world wars happened in Europe? If you think that the real problem of war is the contradiction between, between a territory which is adapted to a certain model of structure, economic structure, uh, industrial structure, and it becomes regional, global, bigger, 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 and bigger. And the political unity is not expanding in the same way. It's always the same. So then you need to expand the political unity. You can do it by peaceful means, European integration, or by, uh, by war, like Hitler tried to do. So this is something which is happening now, too. This is happening now. This is a real tension, and if I'm right on that, there we are going to see big tension between China and the United States, even worse. And I hope the world doesn't need uh, two world wars like Europe needed in order to think about the unification of the political unity. Because it will be at the present uh, stage, at the present development of, of arms and nuclear proliferation, that will be a very, very worrying perspective. Merci. Une dernière question, monsieur, ici. Merci. 
First, thank you very much for your interventions and the perspective that you're sharing with us and a potential horizon. I might address this question to Mr. Iglesias because he referred to it several times. Is there enough trauma in the populations and in global politics to actually quickly act before we face the risk of a stronger war? Are we mobilized enough, all of us, to get there? Because I fear it might not be the case, which might explain why certain countries are trying to avoid global systems because they want to resolve their own interests before resolving global peace. I'll give the floor to Mr. Ecclesias. Would you like to answer? I think it depends on the topic. Where global governance can accelerate is where there is awareness of this actual emergency. And it's true that states only enter international cooperation in case of an emergency. One is recognized, that is the climate emergency, but economic, much less. There's no, not a feeling of urgency. And I think we're underestimating this erosion of the global governance system. I agree with you. As long as there is no awareness around the risk of erosion, then there is no political will amongst intergovernmental systems which fully rely on political will, as you said. Mr. Iglesias? Benjamin Correa wanted to take the floor. No, I just want to say this is an excellent question. It's not just a question, it's actually a, a comment. Is the pressure enough to make measures and institution change? I don't think it's enough. There's enough awareness. But what's happening with the climate and its subproduct, the pandemic, all the international institution, like the IPCC, are alerting us on an even faster pace than we thought, which is a race that has started. Will we, will we be ready? I don't know. But it's al almost optimistic to think that the pressure won't stop, that it will continue to be extremely strong. And from this point of view, those very negative perspectives that we're facing Amongst this, the only hope is that it's getting closer. During the summer, we saw the ice melting over Canada. Then it was Germany. There are floodings in France, not mentioning droughts at international level. So I'd like to say that I fully subscribe to the question, which is very relevant, and I believe the pressure is going to be so strong that things will need to change. Mr. Iglesias? Well, you know, the, some kind of political unification of the war, as democratic, democratic and federal as possible, is impossible, but it's necessary. If we are going to reach something like, like that, and if we are going to evolve uh, fast enough in order to avoid a big crisis? I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, but uh, I, I think that the, the risks are racing in a very fast way, and the answer are not racing at the same pace. So if you look at you know, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, singularity, the possibility of uh, general artificial intelligence controlling everything, with no, it's um, it's really uh, threatening, it's really uh, amazing uh, 
And if you look at the climate change problem, pandemic, and the uh, crisis and the tensions between the U.S. and the Chinese, well, you know, I'm not such <laughs> so optimistic. Uh, in any case, uh, my optimism arrives to this. At the end of the First World War, we didn't have, the, uh, Europe didn't have a leadership convinced on the need of integration. And that's why we had the Second World War. We had Nazism, Fascism, Genocide. At the end of the Second World War, we were ready. And every time I think about the possibilities of this uh, necessary impossibility, uh, I used to think in my favorite leader, which is an Italian one, Altiero Spinelli. Uh, this year uh, was the 80th anniversary of the um, Manifesto of Ventotene. Think about this. Uh, the basis, the political basis and the basic ideas of the um, European Union, regional integration, were written, they were a long tradition, but they were consolidated by a person who was, um, who was a prisoner of Mussolini in a small island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea when he was just a prisoner. It was June of 1941. This means, this means that the worst period of the war. So uh, the United States were not still part of the war. Uh, Germany was dominating all Europe and um, the Soviet Union was together still with uh, Hitler. So think about the situation. So. Uh, when I feel very uncomfortable and pessimistic, I think about Spinelli writing uh, the Ventotene Manifest and uh, his uh, wife um, putting the, the, the papers, the, the writings inside uh, a chicken. Uh, they escaped uh, Ventotene with the manifest inside a cooking, uh, a, a cook chicken uh, in order to uh, avoid the uh, fascist control. So, think about it. Merci. Pour conclure, je, je voudrais juste dire quelques mots là-dessus parce que, effectivement, je pense que c'est une question centrale. Je crois que pendant très longtemps, beaucoup de temps, on a été très Yes, uh, to conclude, I think it's a central issue. For too long, many people did not take into account the climate issue. There were other problems. Tsunamis, droughts seemed like an issue of developing countries. People didn't feel involved. But now, floodings and other climate change impacts are on our own territories in France, European countries or neighboring countries. Many people start to understand that maybe this is what was not utopia, that it might be an important issue and that we're involved with. I think it's progressing slowly and it might be up to the population of the countries to make this issue theirs so that at least in democracies this becomes an electoral issue and that politicians, although they're not convinced, understand that if they want to be elected or re-elected, they must act. So it's up to the population to make that issue a political issue. I think the society is more aware than some politicians. We might need to stop now. Maybe we had other questions, but I'd like to thank the participants of this roundtable. Thank you to everyone for listening to us and for being so many. Have a great evening.